Good morning. Happy Easter. It's so good to be here with you this morning and to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose, which is an amazing thing. I just, as I was contemplating it this morning, going, it's almost preposterous what we're saying we believe in, isn't it? I mean, it's one of those amazing things that if you were hearing it and this wasn't something you'd just grown up with, you'd go, right. So he died and then he came to life again. And then he went to heaven. So it's really cool. I mean, it's, it is the reality that we are living into, and it's just so cool that we get to celebrate that uh, today. So um, usually uh, at the beginning of our service, we start with, um, we, we intentionally are in little groups so that we can share together. And so um, we spend about four minutes and we're sharing the gratitude. And the prompt for today is, how is Jesus bringing the resurrection life into reality in your life? So how are you seeing the resurrected life in your life? So I'll give you about four minutes to share in your little groups, um, and then I'll be back up here and we'll continue. So. Oh, oh cool, 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 I know, cool. Right? Oh, here it is. I found it. Never mind. We'll be fine. <laughs> Is this shirt's weird? Is this shirt's weird? Because there's two buttons right up at the top. If I go with the lower one, it gives me a little more neck room. Which it might need. Totally need that. Yeah. Just for this one, particularly. If I'm going to. So where is the E from? Are you coming in on the first chord or the second chord? Oh, because I do the, uh, I do the, well, right, I do the have it written right here. No, so I have the different ones that were based on the E. Okay.
thank you so much for taking that time and sharing together. We, we really believe that um, uh, it's important for us to recognize the, the ways that God is working in our lives, and that's kind of an important way for us to enter into worship together. Um, on the, the sheets that you have, they, if you want a, an order of worship, so you can see kind of how things are going to go this morning, you can look in the back of this sheet here. Um, so my name is Travis Mock, and I'm one of the shepherds here at the Tempe Church, and we're just so glad that you're all here, whether you're a longtime member or a guest or you're online. Uh, we just so appreciate you being here and in, in celebrating uh, Jesus' resurrection and what that means for our lives, not just a point in time that that was insignificant, but it's significant in our lives in each moment that we live and that we're invited into living this new life, and it's because of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven that that matters. So um, let's pray, and then we'll continue with our worship. Um, God, we just praise you for um, your salvation through Jesus and uh, the resurrection that promises us new life, and that if he hadn't been resurrected, then, then we would have no hope. But because he was and is resurrected, that um, we can uh, look forward to uh, an eternity with you, and but also a new life that starts now, um, that your spirit empowers us to, to live um, differently than we did before. Um, God, we thank you for the ways that you uh, constantly redeem the, the things in our lives, that you bring good out of our mistakes, and you bring good out of even the good things that we do. Um, God, we just praise you for your goodness and your power and your strength, and we just celebrate um, what you have accomplished in Jesus and how that was such a pivotal moment in all of history. It's in your blessed son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, Tempe Church. If you would like to stand, or if you're able to stand and would like to, please do as we sing together. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and the treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
it's better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the move for good for the lamb that conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who is resurrected Oh. 
Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. <laughs> it is such a joy to be with you this morning. My name is Claire, and I'm one of the ministers here at Tempe Church. And I am very fortunate today to be able to direct our focus uh, towards communion at this time in our service. Communion, or the Lord's Supper, is a meal that we share together every week as a ritual, a physical reminder of Jesus' body broken and his blood poured out. In Mark chapter 14, verse 22, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper when he said to his gathered disciples, And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
I wonder what it was like the first time the disciples gathered to share a meal after Jesus' death. Did they find themselves on the day after the crucifixion, scattered and clustered in small groups, hidden away, taking a cup, breaking bread? I wonder who carried Jesus' body after he was taken down from the cross. As they took the bread, could they still feel the weight of him? In their arms. I wonder if when Mary saw the deep warm red in her cup, she remembered cleaning dried blood from Jesus' skin. I wonder if she remembered pulling thorns that were embedded in his scalp as they prepared his body for burial. Did Jesus' mother as she felt the crack of broken bread. Remember the oil she rubbed into his pierced hands, hands that were once small, reaching out for her when Jesus was just a child. Whenever I attend a funeral with my mom, either in the car ride home or whispered before the service, she will always passionately tell me the same command. Never have her funeral in a church. Her reasoning, her dad's funeral and viewing were at her childhood church. And she can never go back into that building without remembering her final moments with her father's body his coffin sitting beneath the podium is always there every time she enters this place that was once also a home to so many other memories, good, beautiful memories of being loved by a community and learning about God. But it is the memory of death that darkens this place for her now. Was this the experience of the disciples when they finally sat down to eat and drink? Were their memories consumed by images of Jesus' death? Was it impossible not to remember his blood, his broken body? Was the drink bitter like the vinegar that still clung to his lips? Was the bread stale, like Jesus' body, now cold, touch, and rigid? When we share this meal together, we too remember the pain that Jesus suffered and the abuse his body endured. But, that powerful, profound but... This is not the end of the story. Do we really recognize how good Jesus is? He's so kind. He's so thoughtful. I am in awe that Jesus takes the trauma of carrying his lifeless, abused body and gives his followers, his friends, the gift of his body again in their midst. Touch me, eat with me, break bread with me, drink with me, be with me. Be with my body warm and breathing and alive again. Jesus replaces a body in a tomb with his ascension as the final moments that his followers share with him. How I wish that the first thing my mother remembered when she entered her childhood church was her father's voice singing when they worshiped together. 
instead of a coffin. But this is the hope that we have. One day, my mom will no longer be forced to cling to a memory of death and will instead hear her father's voice again. Jesus paved the way. He would not allow death to be the final memory he shared with the ones he loved. And he will not allow it still with us. Today, when we take this cup and bread, may we rejoice that we have new memories with Jesus. That his blood poured out is still flowing. His body broken is still breathing. His absence is still a living presence with us every day. Pray with me. Jesus, today we rejoice. We rejoice in your resurrection. We rejoice that you, you have left us with the memory of your voice calling our name. You leave us with your presence still. You are with us in all things. God, we rejoice that you live. And we pray that you will help us every day to cling to the hope that all things will be brought to new life. You were just the first. You will not be the last. For you, God, are so good to us. And you will make all things new. We rejoice in that, God. Please help us live it and believe it with every ounce of us. Bless this cup and this bread, your blood, your body still flowing. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There is a song that I really love that we sing usually during Advent. It's called uh, Seasons by Hillsong, I believe. And I love the last 
the last stanza of it says, Like a seed you were sown for the sake of us all, from Bethlehem's soil grew Calvary's sequoia. And I just love that image of, of this recognition that when Jesus is born, there is an intent, there is, there is a purpose. And it makes his birth so much more powerful that, that Jesus would be born knowing that his birth starts that chain of events that eventually leads to the cross. And I love that we have reclaimed the cross as, as a community. Christians for centuries have, have adopted the cross as our symbol, right? Our symbol of, of Jesus' suffer, suffering, but, but even more so our symbol of life and Jesus' care for us and being invited into community. It's just this rich symbol. It's our symbol and at the same time, I wonder sometimes if we should instead have our symbol be a tree, a, a new tree, a fledgling tree. Because what Jesus does at the cross is his resurrection, this wood that is killed, it was a tree that is killed and used to hang a man on, a, on his cross to kill and murder. And I think Jesus can take it back to a tree. I think he does. Just as he restored his body to life, I think he can take wood and nails and make it a tree where something beautiful can grow. And so I love this practice that we have every year during Easter of adding flowers to this tree as a reminder of what Jesus can do with dead things, bring them back to life again and again. And so during this time, I invite you to come up to the front and you can take a flower and place it inside of our cross. And I want you to bring to this what you want Jesus to continue to bring to life in your life. Pray with me again. Jesus, we come now to bring to you all that we have, we ask that you will take death wherever it lives, wherever it thrives, and make it real life, new life. Thank you that you take dead things to make them new. with us now. Amen.
We're going to have a choral group come now and sing some more traditional hymns around this Easter service. We invite you to sing along. You can stay in your seats if you prefer to stand, um, however you prefer to worship.
You may be seated. Children, you can meet your teacher in the back of the class. On Friday, a thief. <clears throat> on Sunday, a king. Laid down in grief, but woke with the keys of hell on that day, firstborn of the slain. The man Jesus Christ laid death in his grave. He is risen. He is risen. You did better last year. Come on, he is risen. <laughs> okay, that's all right. You're Church of Christ, I get it. Um, it's not what you look at that matters says Henry David Thoreau, it's what you see. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Um, as we go through life, we never simply look at anything without interpreting it. Um, or not, I suppose. We may move past a lot of things. But we never simply see a thing, we perceive it, we interpret it, we know it, and hopefully we know it better. We know one another we know one another better. So what I want to do today is to look at this resurrection story and through this image and some words shared, see if we can see Jesus together. In John 20, verse 11, <clears throat> Mary stood outside the, uh, near the tomb crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head, one at the feet. The angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she replied, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've put him. And as soon as she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, just tell me where you've put him. I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me. I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and my sisters and tell them. I am going up to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. So what do we see in this garden scene? Mary Magdalene, I mean, emotional jet lag, right? She's got this psychological seismic shift that has happened over Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter morning. This is mental whiplash at its best and worst. She has this existential vertigo going on because when she got there, she could not believe he had died. And by the time you get to the end of the story, just a few moments, she cannot believe he is alive, which I believe still remains a Guinness World Record. We are alive in here too, right? It was really the worst Passover celebration ever. It's a rough weekend. And so early in the morning, first day of the week, as Mary makes her way to the tomb, I imagine her as being awake, but only sort of. She's had this numbing grief that she has been sitting with, perhaps not moving much at all from Friday evening through Saturday and now into Sunday morning. She's what I've recently learned uh, to call a noctambulist. I've been saving this word for you. It just means sleepwalking. So she's asleep on her feet. She's been living this very, very bad dream. I imagine it might be hard for her to walk a straight line, but what she does in this grief-stricken moment is walk straight to the tomb of Jesus. And so like a splash of cold water, she's jolted awake at the sound of her name, Mary. 
And she supposes until that moment that he was the gardener. And I suppose she wasn't exactly wrong. Think about the Hebrew story of when we first meet God. Where is it but a garden? We meet God as creator, and he takes on the role immediately of a gardener. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and he put there the human he had formed. So of all the stories to tell that make sense of reality as we live it, maybe a garden is a good metaphor to work from. God says, just suppose I am a gardener and see what you learn. And so this setting of a garden and the characters that we find there inform how we ought to see the world. And in the setting of a garden, we learn about ourselves and we learn about the gardener. But as if Satan, of course, is waiting at the edge of the stage for his cue, you only get a couple pages into the story and he shows up. Death, pain, shame, the reality that we experience. The reality that Jesus comes in contrast to. It all takes place in a garden. So we get this gift of life and immediately find that a gift can still have this potential for great pain. This is high stakes gardening. And so I don't suppose it's an accident that most of the passion story when we get to Jesus and this godly response to the pain of the world, where else should it take place except in a garden or right next to a garden? Christ, our constant gardener. So patiently, persistently cultivating life in the face of my very clumsy cursing. Here is life. Let's see what you do with it. Oh, that's what you're going to do with it? It's in this garden where Jesus pleads. Maybe this cup can pass. All things are possible for you. But ultimately, he obeys. It's in this garden where Adam and Eve hide and blame. But it's in a garden where Jesus allows himself to be found and arrested. It's in the garden where Jesus wears the symbolic curse, the thorn, the crown of thorns. It's in a hill-turned garden that Claire referenced earlier for us, where the cross that's intended to be an end of life becomes a tree budding into new life. It's in a garden that Jesus is laid in a tomb. It's in the entrance to that original garden where angels stand guard and say, you can't come back here. And it's in Jesus' tomb where an angel stands waiting for Mary, saying, there's nothing left for you here. It's in a garden that Mary believes Jesus to be a gardener. It says, oh, there's there's one of us. And I think Jesus says, ah, mission accomplished. It's in this garden where God and man meet, we live together, we work out the pain of death and life. It is in this garden that Jesus undoes the curse of sin and death. You see, we serve a God who is both garden and gardener. He is the source and the substance of life. And yet we have this collective purple thumb, don't we? This gift of life is given to us. Let's see what you do with it. Oh, that's what you're going to do with it. Relationships are hard. So we've learned to love those who love us back. That's about the best I can do for you. You could tell the story of humanity as this long list of families fighting each other, right? Just betrayal after betrayal. And yet Jesus, this constant gardener, cultivating life, teaches us how to be in relationship. It's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. I think Jesus would say it like this. It's who you see. And more critical than that, it's how and who God sees. 
God takes this list, this long list of betrayals, and he sees it. And he lives it with us. He adds his name to the list. I just want to walk quickly through this list of names, Jesus' passion experience. <clears throat> so he's had this awful time in the garden. And he's been praying that this cup would pass, but it doesn't, and so he walks towards the cross. And yet, despite having this very clear vision of what awaits him, you realize as you read the story, he never loses sight of the characters coming and going. Peter, you're going to deny me more than once. And on that third denial, it says that the Lord looked and made eye contact with Peter. Betrayal. And yet we know that's not the end of the story. Later he feeds him, gives him the best meal he's ever had, I imagine, and says, now go feed my sheep. At the cross, as he's dying, he looks down and there's his mother and he says, woman, behold your son. He makes sure that she's taken care of. There's a famous fresco. It's not this one, but I hope you're soaking this one in. Of Mary um, having passed away, she's surrounded by the apostles. And above her is Christ, her son, holding her as if she were the child. And the peaceful face that she wears in death is as if a child swaddled in grave clothes as she had swaddled him when he was in her arms. The way the story ought to go. There's a thief hanging on both sides of Jesus. Actually, there's two thieves, right? One responds really well. And in the process of dying a thief's death, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. There are soldiers around who, who knows what they're thinking, and all Jesus can think is, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. It does dawn on one of them at one point, to where he at least says this, surely this man was the Son of God. And when we reach Mary at the tomb, resurrection morning, I think the story is told in a way that it's singular for us to say that we are each Mary, standing at a tomb, crying, awaiting the Savior's voice to interrupt those tears, speaking our name in Mary's place. I'd say all those stories quickly because I think those are the stories that are the template to tell all the stories that are left undone. All the stories that we think maybe have already ended. All the stories that seem impossibly broken and lost. So I want to look at one more story. This is the story, very briefly, of Pilate and his wife. So as Jesus stands trial before the governor, Pilate, right? There's this odd, mysterious verse interjected there, one verse. His wife sends a message and breaks in. Um, by the way, I don't think you should have anything to do with this guy. He's innocent, he's righteous, and I've been suffering terribly in a dream because of him. So if you've been here for a while, you knew I had to work a dream into this series. <laughs> she has this nightmarish dream where she suffers, she says, as a result of Christ. And it's a warning to have nothing to do with putting him to death. Warning ignored. So I want to imagine with you how this story unfolds from there, because we don't really know a whole lot more about Pilate, except his life seems to traject down from there. But man, here's his wife having this dream, like one kind of born out of season. It's like the foretaste of Pentecost, right? Your, your young men, your old men, your young women, they're going to dream dreams. They're going to see visions. And she is leading the way before Christ is even on the cross. She has this dream about Jesus being an innocent, righteous sufferer. So I want us to think about Pilate and his wife to Jesus there pre-crucifixion as Saul, that apostle, was to Jesus post crucifixion. They're asking questions like, who are you? And now we know how much we must suffer for your sake. I don't know if you know this, but in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, 
they have a feast day for Pilate and his wife. And it's not a feast day of how sad for Pilate and his wife. It is a feast day as if they were saints. They tell this story that goes all the way back to the second century as if Pilate and the wife respond to the resurrection in belief, as if they become followers of Christ themselves. And so every year, they hold a feast and they celebrate these two people who, like Saul, were so against, like, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Herod and Pilate, we know from Scripture, become friends because of their mutual opposition to Jesus, it says in Luke. They became friends that day, even though up to that day they had been enemies. So I like to imagine they begin talking more and more after these events. And we know from Scripture that Herod's chief servant, his wife Joanna, was supporting Jesus' ministry. There's already a disciple in the room. So I like to imagine this shocking dream drawing these people together. And Joanna saying, oh yeah, I can tell you about this innocent, righteous sufferer. And I also imagine, so thanks for playing along, this is my imagining. I imagine Jesus standing before Pilate. Perhaps his eyes are swollen shut from the beating he has been taking. But if you look closely, he's winking. You just can't tell because his eyes are swollen. Because he's got this clear picture of the cross. and He never loses sight of the people. The reason he's going to die and be raised. So from tradition, they say Pilate's wife, her name is Claudia. And some say this is the Claudia that Paul says, oh, say hi to Claudia in his letter to Timothy. So I say all that to say, I don't know if that's true in detail, but I find it true in principle. That when Jesus tells a story, it ends different than you think it ought to end. That he'll take his fiercest opponent and the worst that they can do to him, that they think they can do. And he says, I can work with that. I think that follows the very heart of God in every other story we know. Stories of suffering and death inevitably turn to life. This is the Christian imagination that the world needs. These are the eyes to know what we're looking at and who we're dealing with, the image of Christ seen everywhere we look in all creation. This is the inevitable rest of the story. So, I'd like you to hold yourself in this moment in your own mind with all your struggles and failings or perhaps someone that you care about who is having their share of struggles right now. And all they know to do is speak the weight of death. That's the narrative. Everything's broken. And as you hold that, like, what do you hope for yourself in that? What would be too good to be true? What would be the best possible outcome if only you might dare to dream it? And then I want you to ask, how do you think God views that situation? And could you possibly imagine that God might hope a little bigger than you do? Which leads us to this. I love this picture. Um, this is an icon by a Ukrainian woman called Anastasis, which means resurrection. In this picture, Adam and Eve are held by the wrist by Jesus. That's Adam on the right, Eve on the left. They represent humanity being pulled from the grave. 
In this picture, we see Jesus takes the cross and he turns that instrument of torture and shame into an international peace symbol. We don't look at it the same way anymore, do we? In this picture, you can't see it. It's cut off at the bottom. There's broken gates and there's keys and locks dashed around. Because when Jesus charges the gates of hell, he doesn't then close them neatly on his way out. He leaves them off their hinges on the ground. And the best Satan can do in that moment is just hope you don't notice. It is the risen Christ who doesn't rise for his own sake. He's already the king of life. He rises for yours. And in his rising, he raises everything. He heals all things. Every road, every story, every individual leads to the road that we talked about last week that leads to the cross, that leads to death, that leads to a grave, that leads to emptiness that is not the kind of emptiness you imagine. It is the emptying of all that death would do. And it has lost its power because Jesus is alive. And when he died, he didn't just say, hey, aren't I great? He did the work of dismantling all that is against. I love how in the tomb, in that story of everything being compressed down to that road and that end point, seemingly an end point, everything get, it just gets pressed down to this almost unsustainable small point. I don't know how atom bombs work, but I think this is something like that, right? It's, everything is just like, or black holes. I wish Jude was here. He would tell me. Everything gets compressed down to this unsustainable tiny bit that can't stay that way. It's got to burst back out into life. And that's exactly what happens, because we know the king of life. God could not stay dead. He tried it. It wasn't for him. And he says, it's not for you either. In the first Easter sermons that were preached by the earliest Christians, they would talk about Jesus being the bait, and death takes it, and the grave swallows Jesus because mortality can die. But here's the trick. Divinity can't. And so it's as if death itself has this terrible case of food poisoning. <laughs> and in this trick, the grave vomits up Christ as Jonah is vomited up by the fish, right? It's like, oh, we've got him where we want him. And as weird as that picture may be, this is the joke of resurrection. Joke is, or resurrection is the joke that is told at death's expense. And maybe one of these days, we'll look at pictures like this. We'll tell the Jesus story. We'll finally catch the punchline. And we will laugh, because that is good news beyond belief. And we will laugh until the tears are running down our faces. And we are not crying for the same reason we used to cry. So when you look at Jesus, what do you see? Who do you see? Jesus plays out a conversation that goes something like this. Lord, when did we see you? And he says, it was when you saw the needs of others and you responded. I saw that. And you saw me in that, even when you didn't realize what you were looking at. Because it's what God sees that matters. Hearts that hope against hope. So he teaches us to see, to hear, and he calls our names. And this is the best part, because we get to get in line, in one tomb at a time. Tombs become the wombs that birth life. And he calls your name. And he says, wake up. And we do. So observe, look and see. Jesus cheats death. He conquers, he rules, he uses death against itself. In the garden of creation, 
Jesus, the king, causes death to serve life. As Catherine will tell you, every good garden needs compost. And so Jesus says, nothing is wasted. All the ugliness will serve beauty. All the decay will feed order. This is resurrection. Life where you didn't think it could possibly be, but that's the truest story there actually is. So we're going to respond in song, and we're going to worship the king of life who says, it's for you. On Friday, a thief. On Sunday, a king. Laid down in grief, but woke with the keys of hell on that day. Firstborn of the slain, the man Jesus Christ laid death in his grave. He is risen. You got it that time. All right, if you would like to stand and sing with us one more time, please do. The splendor of the king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our Time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead free in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Lion and the Lamb, how great is our God, sing with me how great.
You may be seated. How great is our God. Amen. I'm Hannah Parmalee. I'm one of the ministers here. I'm the campus minister, and it's a delight to get to celebrate our risen Savior together this morning. Um, he, he is risen. Amen. Jesus is alive. He is with us, and he is offering us life and life abundant. It's the very best news. So how will we respond? What do we do with the best news we've ever been given? How do we respond to our risen Savior? How do we re- what do we do in response to our God of such extravagant love, of sacrifice, power, and generosity? How do we live? What do we do with this life that is offered to us by Jesus? Will we give our very selves to him? Will we offer everything we are and everything we have to him? Do we take him in as Lord and Savior? Do we put him on in baptism to receive his life, to say yes to his life? Do we surrender every area of our life to him, to his kind of life, laying down at the cross all of our old ways because they just don't work? And do we allow Jesus to resurrect and bring new life, divine life, life that is good beyond our wildest expectations? What do we lay down to him? Our time, our thought, our attention, our talents, our finances, our feelings, our desires, our goals. What do we need to lay down to him? In this community here, one of the things that I love about us is that we know that we can pursue this life with God together and that we need each other. And so we are together frequently. Um, Our small groups are still ongoing throughout the week um, in all sorts of different areas. And we would love, if you're not part of that, um, we would love for you to be part of one of those groups. Um, We have, I'm going to tell you some about what's going on. So if you're not plugged in, you can get plugged in. Or if you just don't know what's happening, now you'll know. How do we pursue this life with God together? Here's some things that we do together. Um, So small groups, if you're not plugged in, you can see me or one of our other um, church leaders, and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, We have prayer time at ASU every Wednesday at 7, meet outside the Danforth Chapel. We get some time to pray together. Um, uh, On Saturday, April 6th, um, we're doing the um, Serving Together with the Welcome to America Project. Um, serving refugees who have just come to live in our city. See Liz, Liz, um, about that. On April 20th, we have two opportunities. There's crafting conversation and coffee. If you are a crafter and a, a tea or coffee lover, uh, meet at Steve's Espresso. Steve's Espresso, is that right? I'm looking for Claire. Yes, Steve's Espresso. Um, 9.30, Claire? 9, 9 o'clock. Um, And then there's also our 50s plus lunch here at noon on April 20th. On April 21st, Sunday, we have our final session of our parenting seminar. Um, We're doing one to four, so mark your calendars, one to four, final session of our parenting seminar that's been amazing together. Also mark your calendars, April 27th um, is Adrian and Jared's baby girl baby shower. We're so excited for you guys. Yay! Uh, So mark your calendars for that, too, April 27th. If you're visiting with us, we would love to get to know you. Um, There's these little cards um, on the back table back there. Um, And if you'll fill that out, we will get get in touch with you. Or please stay and let us meet you and get to know you. Um, And we're happy that you're here. Welcome. Um, We have the Stations of the Cross are up still. 
Um, thank you to Claire and to everybody who set this set these up. This has been really wonderful this week to have the stations. Um, if you want to stay longer after service and experience those, you are welcome to. There's a booklet that goes with them that's also at the back. Um, so you can grab that and walk through any of the stations of the cross. And then um, another thank you to Claire. Claire, you've been busy lately, babe. Um, we have the, this wonderful Eastertide devotional that has been put together um, and organized by Claire and contributed to by many of our congregations. So thank you so much for contributing to this, everybody that has. This is a daily devotional um, that is beautifully put together, and we can walk through um, as, as a community and be just deeply immersed in what is this life? What is this life that Jesus offers us? Um, so there is uh, six weeks of devotional in here um, for us to do together. Claire has them at the back, so after service you can see her if you would like um, one of these. Um, thank you so much for everybody that put that together. I'm excited to continue these conversations together. And then um, as we wrap up, we do have one more activity afterwards for our um, middle schoolers and high schoolers. So sixth grade through 12th grade, um, we have another Easter egg hunt for you, and it's going to be over in the Oasis. Um, and so you can follow me over there if you want to take 10 minutes um, just afterwards. And there's a ton of eggs, so please come help find the eggs. <laughs> um, okay. I think that was all the announcements. Let's go ahead and close in prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your beauty. Lord, we thank you for your power over death. And we thank you for your extravagant and generous love that invites us into your life to life that is really life. Lord, we ask for your help to grab hold of your hand and to walk with you in every moment of our lives, learning how to really live. Lord, we thank you for giving us one another to help hold us up when things are hard. And for giving us one another to celebrate with and to encourage and to rejoice with. We thank you for your provision for us in every way. Lord, we thank you for your rain today that refreshes the earth. Thank you, Lord, for your great beauty and love. Thank you for time to worship you, to remember together, and to recognize your mighty, mighty work in our lives. Jesus, we love you. We are in awe of you. And we thank you with everything that is within us. It's in your beautiful and precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Dismissed, allow us to uh, play you out with an old favorite for this Easter Sunday. <laughs> Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm 
so glad you came to save us. 